Denier is the god of glyphs, literature, and scribes. While prone to rambling, Denier has a depth of knowledge beyond most other entities. The Denirath faith likewise plays a deep importance upon recording and acquiring written knowledge of all sorts and mediums. They often can be found teaching others basic literacy skills and scrubbing works in their places of worship. I'm Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. Titles Denier goes by the following titles Lord of all glyphs and images, the scribe of Ogma, and the first scribe. Denier has no known aliases. Portfolio and domains Denier holds the portfolios of glyphs, images, literature, scribes, and cartography. Denier's suggested domains for 5th edition are Arcana and Knowledge. Appearance and Manifestations The most popular Denirath depiction of Denir is that of an elderly, balding sage with a bright white beard. All depictions of Denir show him holding a quill in hand. Either he is shown writing on scrolls or in books, or simply carrying one of those two items, if not both. There is some discrepancy in the ways in which his eyes are portrayed. Some may depict him with purple eyes and triangular pupils, much like the eye found on his best-known holy symbol. Others choose eyes of ice blue or fiery blue orbs for Denier. Why the discrepancy exists, I am unsure. Denier's favorite weapon is said to be a whirling glyph. 3rd edition's Faiths and Pantheons ascribes this whirling glyph the tag of a dagger. No more was said about this whirling glyph, unfortunately. Denier's avatar appears often to have the same appearance as his depictions in art. However, if Denier wishes his avatar to be undetected, the avatar may take on a younger appearance. The avatar wears bulky robes that bear all sorts of glyphs and symbols. It is thought that these markings serve as reminders to the avatar of certain information. Should anyone else touch the glyphs, however, a random magical effect will occur. As the avatar travels, they carry a multitude of tomes, quills, and parchment. Some of these items may seem to be dropped accidentally by the avatar, though the avatar is conscious of such things happening. These dropped items are either magic items themselves or contain the instruction for creating magic items or constructs. Denier has one known manifestation with a few variations. A nimbus of light surrounds a book. Should a person open said book, Denier can cause a small bit of radiant light to move about the pages to point things out to the reader. Denier can cause books and other objects to move about as if affected by telekinesis near the Nimbus. Denier can manifest a human hand from out of the Nimbus described earlier. This hand can cast spells, carry items, and gesture. It is rare for Denier to speak through this Nimbus. Rather, the manifested hand may trace letters of fire in the air or cause a magic-like effect to make the audience think that they are seeing letters of fire being traced out in the air. Denier makes use of the following creatures to communicate his approval, disapproval, or aid his mortal followers. Baku Holy Ones Einhariar of Great Sages Light Asamons Movanic Devas Planetars Wisdom Incarnates Calico Cats White Dogs with Golden Eyes Pinto and piebald horses, and gold or yellow horses. Denier can also manifest items on the prime material to reward his mortal followers. Candles, quill pens, writing brushes, gold or yellow flowers, and a few select gemstones, namely topaz, tourmaline, iolite, and star sapphires. Abilities To start, Denier is given the rank of a demi-power in 1st edition and some earlier 2nd edition products. 
Later on in 2nd edition and 3rd edition, Denier is given the rank of a lesser deity. Why this occurred, I could find no explicit mention as to why there was the change. We will discuss it in a bit, but Denier disappeared from the Forgotten Realms in the 4th edition era, only to then resurface during the Second Sundering and occupy a spot in the Faerunian Pantheon once more. As it is, we know only a couple of divine ranks for deities in the realms. But I think we can easily place Denier in the lesser deity category in the 5th edition deific hierarchy. We unfortunately do not have access to a lengthy list of abilities prescribed to Denier as a god. He, like many others, did not get a full stat block in 3rd edition. Though in 2nd edition's face and avatars, we have the statistics and features for his avatar. Just be aware, these mechanics are couched in 2nd edition terms. The avatar has access to all spheres or schools of magic. Though Denier's avatar avoids accessing any sort of magic that may result in the damage to any written piece within the vicinity. The avatar has an aversion to battle and will attempt to escape at the first opportunity. Those who witness the avatar in martial combat are all too aware just how unskilled the avatar is despite their apparent power level. The avatar can summon forth any scroll with any spell upon it and cast it readily. If struck by the avatar's physical touch, a creature may be affected by the confusion spell with no save. If the avatar's target has ever been damaged by a glyph or symbol in the past, the avatar is aware of this fact and can choose to afflict their target with that same damage and or effect again, in lieu of casting any spell. Denier's avatar is immune to any spell cast towards them that comes from a scroll or magical effect whose power source is a book. Finally, the avatar is immune to charm and illusion slash phantasm spells, spell-like effects, and abilities. Personal History In the history of the Forgotten Realms, Denier is still a relatively new deity among his fellows. I did not find a listed year tied to Denier's ascension to godhood and service of Ogma. But a couple source books did point out that Denier's faith was founded in 25 Dale Reckoning. I would assume that Denier would have ascended a couple to a few years prior. Regardless, Denier's ascension as a mortal to godhood is due to Denier's glimpse at a tome known as the Metatext. The Metatext is an immensely powerful tome that Denier believes contains all the secrets to the multiverse. The issue is that the words and phrases that make up the metatext are believed to be scattered throughout all the written works on the prime material. The collection of all these bits of the metatext is what drives Denier. This drive is also shared among Denier's clergy and followers. With many of his portfolios covering much of the written word, Denier has a strong grasp over works that may reveal more of the metatext as time progresses. Ogma, Denier's superior and leader of the gods of knowledge and invention, is unsure of any such metatext. Ogma seems fine letting Denier chase the stream, despite what may be a fool's errand in the long run. According to the novel The Ghost King, after Mistra's death and the beginning of the spell plague, Denier attempted to weave himself and what he had of the metatext into the Sundered Weave. It would seem to have worked for a brief amount of time, though Denier would seemingly be absorbed into the weave until the advent of the Second Sundering. Denier has since retaken his place in the Faerudian Pantheon. Personality Denier is a neutral good deity. He lacks any flair. Rather, he is a subdued god more concerned with being studious in the collection of knowledge. He can come across as rather dull and senile to some or immensely knowledgeable and calm to others. Denier's mind always seems to be in more than one place at any one time. Conversing with him may be a confusing affair, as he begins spiraling off on different tangents or his attention is suddenly drawn by some stray thought that takes him out of the conversation completely. You can find time slipping away from yourself if Denier gets going on a topic that diverges off on tangents and he tries to recall where he last left off. Though despite all of his apparent ramblings, Denier will eventually get to his original point, and that point contains just the kernel of knowledge an individual needs. He can come across as an awkward elder who still used antiquated terms from long ago in Faerun's history, 
while attempting to do his best to use current turn of phrases and slang, but coming up short. Despite all of his knowledge, Denier is poor at applying it practically in social situations. Personal Realms In the Great Wheel cosmological model used in 1st edition, 2nd edition, and is the assumed default model for 5th edition Forgotten Realms, Denier resides on the split, neutral good, chaotic good outer plane of the Beastlands. The Beastlands also goes by the titles of the Happy Hunting Grounds and the Three-Tiered Wilderness. Here he resides on the second layer of the Beastlands known as Brux. His shared divine realm is known as the Library of All Knowledge. The Beastlands, as the name suggests, is a plain of untamed wilderness dominated by animals and other creatures alike. Between all the upper plains and the Great Wheel, the Beastlands lacks the most in any settlements or structures. At most, a camp might be found in one's travels. The souls that depart the prime material to come and reside here manifest as animals. Though in the form of these animals, they retain their former intelligence and capability to speak. Visitors to the Beastlands also tend to manifest the physical trait of a given animal after spending time on this wild plain. Though much of the other animals living here are just normal animals and beasts as one would find on the prime material. There's a multitude of different biomes represented in the Beastlands as well. Though every biome is thriving in both flora and fauna. The plain is lit by two celestial bodies, Solera, the plain sun, and Noctos, the plain's moon. Travel between the three layers is fairly easy with the multitude of portals between each of them. Problem is, is that since the portals are so numerous, a person might run in between two trees, only to then wind up on another layer of the Beastlands altogether. And most of these portals are only one way. At this point it needs to be said that in 3rd edition's Manual of the Plains, the description of the Beastlands is much the same, though there was one chief difference. That being that mortal souls who come to reside here do not turn into animals. Rather, they maintain their humanoid form, but come to develop animalistic traits, much like a shifter from Eberron or a lycanthrope. Brux, the second layer of the Beastlands, is sometimes referred to as the land of never-ending twilight. Solera, the sun, and Noctos, the moon, both hang in the sky along the horizon. This shades all of Brux in perpetual dim light. The plants turn their flowers and leaves to face the sun. The temperatures are cool and humid. Fog and mist is a common natural occurrence on Brux. A wide swath of biomes are represented. Animals that are most active at dawn or dusk flourish. The dim light allows long dark shadows to be cast throughout this lair. Some of these shadows are said to hold hidden treasures or passageways to other realms though the local creatures know all too well to use these shadows to better hunt prey. I was able to find the briefest description of Denier's realm. The library of all knowledge contains within it all that is known and true. Malil and Denier both send some of their more powerful servitors to travel to Ogma's realm in the Outlands. It is thought that there is a permanent portal between both Ogma's realm and the library of all knowledge. The Beastlands is admittedly an odd home plane for Denier. Though I can just imagine out in the depths of some forest or swamp is this exquisite and large library that stands out in stark contrast against the nature around it. But I don't think the library of all knowledge is in direct conflict with nature. Rather the two have embraced one another as the library structure is covered by vines and flowers of all sorts. The resident animals are able to fly, crawl, and run about the premises without being harried by the petitioners of Malil and Denier, though the animals know all too well to keep the archives and books well alone. In the World Tree cosmological model used for 3rd edition Forgotten Realms, Denier resides on the plane of the House of Knowledge. This plane is presided over by Denier's superior, Ogma. The library is made up of several buildings here or there across the plane. Denier, Malil, and Gon do not have their own realms here. Instead, they frequent and favor other buildings over others. Here, both oral and written knowledge is valued highly and preserved. The petitioners that reside in the House of Knowledge look much like they did in their mortal lives. Allies and Allegiances Denier is a member of the Gods of Knowledge and Invention. 
They are led by Ogma, the neutral god of invention and knowledge among other portfolios. Ogma places a great deal of importance upon his relationship with the Nier. Ogma provides the realms with the creativity and inspiration to create, whereas the Nier provides the realms with the desire to record and document all that is created. The Nier is known as the right hand of Ogma, and Melil is known as Ogma's left. Though what sort of relationship exists between the Nier and Melil goes unstated though I would imagine it is one of mutual understanding and friendly respect, though I do not think they spend much of the personal time together. Daenerys holds alliances with other members of the Faerunian pantheon. Specifically, he holds alliances with the three deities of the Arcane, Mistra, Azuth, and Savras. As a collector of all information, the deities of the Arcane hold Daenerys as a valued ally due to the records and archives of Arcane knowledge he and his clergy have access to. Lyra is another ally of Daenerys. The goddess of happiness and dance may be an odd choice for an alliance given the reserved nature of Daenerys, but Lyra likes to poke fun and make Daenerys uncomfortable from time to time, and I suspect that Daenerys needs to be reminded every now and then to step away from his studies and to be with people and make merry. Daenerys and Lyra likely interact frequently given the strong alliance Lyra holds with Melil. Daenerys is also allied with Lathander, god of renewal and vitality among other portfolios. Outside of the Faerunian pantheon, Daenerys is allied with Dogmarin Brightmantle, Chaotic Good, Dwarven god of scholarship and discovery, Labellus Enereth, elven god of time and history, and Sir Olali, Halfling Goddess of the Homestead and Friendship. Enemies As a god dedicated to uncovering and recording knowledge, it is no surprise that the Nier is foes with those who love to obscure, hide, and lie. Such deities being Siric, Shar, and Mask. Likewise, the four gods of fury, chiefly Malar and Talos, angered the given their wanton destruction of civilization and its accrued knowledge. Another foe of Daenerys is Bane, lawful evil god of tyranny. Symbols In the Faerunian pantheon, Daenerys' faith has two known holy symbols. The first and the one you will see most often is a lit candle above an eye with a purple iris and triangular pupil. The second is simply a lit candle. Central Dogma From Face and Pantheons, a third edition supplement. Quote, information that is not recorded and saved for later use is information that is lost. Punish those who deface or destroy a book in proportion to the value of the information lost. Literacy is an important gift from Denier. Spread it wherever you travel, that it might touch the hearts and minds of all Faerun. Fill idle hours with the copying of written work, for in such a manner do you propagate knowledge and aid the pursuit of the metatext. Information should be free to all, and all should be able to read it so that lying tongues cannot distort things out of proportion. End quote. Presence of the Faith The Nier's clerics tend to hold an alignment of chaotic good, lawful good, or neutral good. Given his portfolios, the Nier is a favorite deity among historians, lower masters, sages, scholars, scribes, and students. The Daenerath faith hold that anything that isn't preserved in some physical medium is information that exists to be lost. Now, in my opinion, this is a bit of a steep stance considering the importance of oral history throughout the cultures and histories of our real world, but I can see where they are coming from. It is common for lay people to offer up a prayer to Daener before they write something lengthy or begin their scribe work. Artists may also direct a prayer Denier's way before or after completing a painting or other artistic work. Artists tend to do this when portraying the event in its most truthful details. Denier's faith actively supports the efforts of the Harpers, and several within the clergy are Harpers themselves. Denier has had a couple known chosen. Best known was a human by the name of Catterley Bonaduce. According to second edition sources, Catterley held the abilities of a 20th level cleric of Denier. 
A signature ability as the Chosen of Denier was the ability to see unique images upon the shoulders of people. These images were representations of an individual's thoughts and desires. We know of the other powers granted to Denier's Chosen through Catalyst's own mechanics listed out in 2nd Edition's Heroes lore book. Admittedly, one of these abilities seems out of place. Along with the usual turn on dead mechanics of a cleric, the Chosen can hold their holy symbol to Denier against the forehead of an undead creature and outright destroy it. The way it is written, it certainly does not sound like any save is granted to the undead creature. The Chosen is able to brand an individual with their holy symbol. This brand is applied to the forehead and it will serve as an immediate identifier to anyone good or neutrally aligned to avoid and shun this person. The Chosen of Denier is unaffected by any effect that drains character levels regardless of the source. Finally, the Chosen of Denier is able to partially shape change into one particular animal. This partial animal form must be derived from an animal the Chosen has been familiar with since early on in their lives. Catterly, as an example, partially shaped change into a creature that had traits and abilities similar to that of a flying squirrel. Another of R.A. Salvatore's creations, Catterly Bonaduce, is one of the chief characters in the Claire Quintet series of novels. He also becomes involved in later Drist novels. Between those stories, Catterly had the now ruined spirit soaring temple constructed in the Snowflake Mountains. I will discuss the particulars of this temple later. The novel The Ghost King ends with Catterly defeating an entity known as the Ghost King. A Draco Lich, whose mind held the personalities of the Draco Lich themselves, several liches, and a mind flayer. For a short time, Catterly was assisted in battle with the Ghost King by his patron deity, who had just weaved himself into the sundered weave caused by Mistra's murder to set off the spell plague. In order to defeat the Ghost King, unfortunately Catterly gave up his life and became the new Ghost King himself. The new Ghost King forever walks a patrol around the grounds of the destroyed Temple of Spirit Soaring. He wards the temple grounds during his patrol to constantly keep any creatures from leaving the temple grounds out of the permanent rift to the Shadowfell contained within it. Another of Denier's chosen was Catterly's mentor, Pertelope a human priestess of Denier. Pertelope was gifted with prophetic abilities from Denier. She would unfortunately die as a consequence of the Chaos Curse, a recurring problem for Catterly in the Claire Quintet novels. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy Collectively, Denierath clergy are known as Glyph Scribes. There is mention of how the various divine class options fit into the population of the clergy in a second edition source but I do want to mention that this would have been influenced by available character options at the time. Going forward into 3rd edition and onwards, the lore changed to reflect available character options. I mentioned it here for posterity's sake, and perhaps you may use it as inspiration in your own game. The bulk of the Dinirath faith is made up of clerics and monks. Only 15% of the clergy are specialty priests. However, this minority holds the highest ranks in the clergy. Clerics and monks may win a large amount of respect and prestige, but they never come to operate in a leadership position at their place of worship. Many of these monks and clerics are frustrated by this and make adventuring a large part of their lives to become successful in other arenas. The title of priest is used to denote several ranks in the clergy, regardless of gender. The ranks of the clergy in ascending order are applicant, underpriest, aspirant priest, full priest, priest illuminator, priest calligrapher, priest editor, priest secretary, priest librarian, aspirant scrivener, full scrivener, and finally high scrivener. High scrivener is the title granted to a leader of a given temple. Three other ranks exist even above High Scrivener. These ranks are only awarded by Denier himself. There is the Writer Inquisitor, Librarian, and High Librarian. Writer Inquisitor is given by Denier to powerful adventurers in his clergy. 
Another high rank in the Dinirath clergy was mentioned throughout the source books I looked through, though they remain separate from the ranks I described above. I imagine this title is also rewarded by Denir himself. The Scrivener of the Stars is allegedly the highest ranking Denirath who resides in Sadolfor, though this seems to be in direct conflict with the prestige held by the High Librarian, who I will touch on later when covering places of worship. I could not find any more description of what the Scrivener of Stars does or who they are. Despite any structure in the Denirath faith, it holds minimal importance in the daily lives of the clergy. Denir is known to provide his greatest blessings to those who truly love their work as a scholar and or scribe, rather than to those who uphold some rigid temple structure. Thus, individualistic study is encouraged as each Denirath tries to find truths of Denir in the written word. Responsibilities and Duties of the Faithful The faith of Denir holds several responsibilities. The Nirath archive all varieties of information, poems, songs, works and tales of fiction, diaries, and so on. They may record the oral performances of such information or scribe a copy of some written work presented to them. To help in this endeavor, some clergy members have journals they bring on their travels to record all variety of oral accounts heard in stories, songs, and performances. Much of the clergy barely leave the confines of the respective place of worship when fulfilling their duties. Some go out during one of the four seasons and essentially adventure into certain sites where it is said that knowledge has been lost, abandoned, or has been sequestered away. They do this with the intent to make said knowledge known and archive it accordingly. Others still will travel but stick to far less dangerous environs, recording the oral songs and histories of many different cultures. With the possession of an astounding array of knowledge, the faith of Denir either uses one of two approaches to get knowledge out of stingy people and organizations unwilling to pass on their knowledge. The first tactic is to sell the information that Denirath already have. The funds they receive are then turned around and used to purchase information from stingier individuals. The second tactic is a form of manipulation or blackmail. With so much valuable information already, the Denirath easily have dirt on many influential people throughout the realms. Thus, the threat of that information getting out is often enough for these people to pass along what they know. The clergy are to punish those who attempt to hide, destroy, or alter the written word. The punishment is to be equal to that of the information lost. Though the punishment can be called off if the individual is able to come up with a one-to-one -one replacement. In order to become part of the clergy, a vow of charity is sworn. This vow stipulates that any Denirath must provide reading, writing, and transcription services to the poor for free. Those who are degree better off must pay for the material along with a silver piece. Finally, the well-off instead pay a standard scribe's rate. The Denirath teach basic literacy skills as well to the less fortunate. Either this will be done for free or for some paltry amount. The ability to read and write is thought to be a God-given gift to the world for the Denirath. Further training in scribe work, illumination, bookbinding, and parchment making is available, though such training has stiff fees. Given that they often write out letters for a variety of different people, Denirath do learn quite a bit about a local settlement's secrets and atmosphere. Some may pay a large sum to keep such information private. This is known as paying the, quote, price of the silent scribe. A third is kept by the clergy member themselves. The remaining two-thirds of what is paid is received by the local Denirath place of worship. Among their fellow Denirath, however, Information does get disseminated as a broader picture of a specific place gets built up. As some Faerunians say, the pens of Denir also have ears. Many of the Denirath can also create spell scrolls. Spell scrolls scribed by Denirath may be found for purchase at their temples and shrines, though the clergy do not advertise this fact, but rather keep it known to select people. 
The faith may provide trained scribes who are not allied with the, with the near at all. Some have reservations that these scribes may still yet leak what they transcribe back to the local temple of Denir. Orders and Priestly Bodies The Denirath have a trained order of scribes known as the Literate Brotherhood. These scribes have been certified to the highest standard by their respective places of worship. Each member of the Brotherhood wears a pin or badge that displays a white quill with a gold nib. There are three known Denirath monk orders. The first is the preservers of the ordered way. These monks are a cloistered lot who are skilled scribes and illuminators. The second is the disciples of the free word who are well known for hard work in providing the poor and needy with their scribing services. They may be rudely referred to as the pens of the poor. The zealots of the written word are primarily an adventuring order of monks who accompany those clergy who adventure into a variety of different sites in order to find hidden and lost knowledge. They are just as scholarly and well-trained in the day-to-day -day practices carried out by other Denirath clergy. The Zealots also have a deep passion for studying martial arts both academically and physically. Many write theses on martial arts, and it is common to see members carrying tomes and scrolls describing a new martial technique to study and master. Members of this order simply may be referred to as zealots or karmadines. Karmadines is a term used in reference to the order's founder. Wordsmiths are a special type of Denirath cleric. Rather than be clerics armed and ready for battle, they are itinerant teachers and scribes who travel across Faerun. They are a rather intelligent bunch devoted to having extensive knowledge across a wide breadth of topics. However, they refrain from being rude to those who are less well-read. They are more than willing to assist those in any scholarly or artistic pursuits. A small portion of them are more artistic than scholarly. As such, they can be a touch hyperbolic, but otherwise they are just as well-mannered as all other wordsmiths. They all are well-spoken in a variety of languages, to the point that natives have a hard time picking out any flaws in what the wordsmiths say in another tongue. Given their patron deity, it comes as no surprise that they are quite skilled at discerning magical writing and glyphs of all sorts. Despite being a type of cleric, wordsmiths are unable to turn undead and have no proficiency with any armor. The Guardians of the Weave is a loose organization of spellcasters who combat evil spellcasters, the evil deities of magic, and those who look to damage the weave. Specifically in the 3rd edition Era of the Realms, they were at odds with Shar and her followers as they fought incursions of the Shadow Weave throughout the continent. The group is bound by a love for magic, and they do not want to see the Weave harmed to any extent. The symbol of the Guardians is a golden web held within a circle to represent the Weave. Members may display this as a brooch or amulet or keep it hidden, but each member's symbol serves as a way of tracking one another. While primarily populated by Mistrans and Azuthans, the Guardians had some Denirath among them as well. Appearance and Dress The ceremonial dress of the Denirath doubles as their daily wear. Clergy wear a faint tan or white tunic with trousers of the same color. This is accompanied by a medium-length cloak of varying color and pattern to signify the clergy member's rank in the faith. Referring back to the ranks of the faith, Aspirants wear black and white diagonally striped cloaks. Under priests, a fully black cloak. Aspirant priests, a black cloak with a maroon collar. Full priests, a black cloak with a gray central stripe. Priest illuminators, gray cloak with black trim. Priest calligraphers, an all gray cloak. Priest editors, an all indigo cloak. Priest secretaries, an all sepia cloak. Priest librarians, an all turquoise cloak, aspirant scriveners an all royal blue cloak, full scriveners white with gold trim, and finally high scriveners an all white cloak. All these cloaks have a stiff rounded collar. Denira are to always have the holy symbol of Denir visible on their person. Many of them go about with a golden circlet upon their head that bears the near symbol upon the forehead. Every clergy member carries a writing kit contained in a triangular leather pouch on the right hip. 
Within it can be found parchment, inks, and quill pens. The Nirath are allowed to wear whatever armor and or clothing is required for a given mission. Wordsmiths wear the same ceremonial and daily dress as typical Denirath, the only real difference being their cloak is bright crimson in color. They are not well equipped for combat. Some mages keep a light hammer on their person or make use of the quarter staff they travel with for defense. Rituals Clerics and Denirath clergy pray and meditate on their spells in the morning. The Nirath have their daily rituals, prayers, and practices. Some may say a small prayer with every stroke they make in their illumination of texts or before they scribe a single letter on a fresh piece of parchment. Other reserve prayer when they first set out to complete a complex and or important written or archival task. More common practice than it is a ritual. On the third of chess every year, Every Denirath hands in a collected document that contains a copy of every letter and missive that they wrote out in the last year. Meticulously, the superiors in the faith go over all these documents, looking for any connection to the metatext. From there, those small phrases and words are sent to the hidden Iron Dragon Mountain Temple, located somewhere in the Earthfast Mountains. The Librarian Supreme here at this temple will add to the collection of what is thought to be the Metatext. The Only Holy Day is held every four years on Shield Meet. As a brief aside, Shield Meet is equivalent to our real world Leap Year Day, February the 29th, though it holds a much greater importance for the people of Faerun. Shield Meet occurs the day right after Midsummer on the calendar of Harptos. On Shield Meet, the Denirath engage in two rituals. The first involves producing contracts held in Denirath archives and stores for public viewing. The public may also request specific non magical writings from these archives on Shield Meet. Requested written pieces must not conflict with the confidentiality practice by the Denirath. The second ritual on Shield Meet is known as the Gilding. The Nirath circle around a large, levitating piece of manuscript. They then each cast a special spell that inscribes a golden letter upon the manuscript. When read out, the manuscript tells, quote, the words of the Nir for days to come. This manuscript is put out on public display. Any who try to scrape away at the small amount of gold from the manuscript are hunted by junior-level Denirath. General Characteristics of Places of Worship The Nirath temples double as libraries and archives. Attached to them are the required living quarters and amenities for the clergy who attend to the religious and scholarly duties. The Nirath places of worship tend to have secret stashes of information and lore. Such stashes can be as simple as a small safe for the high scrivener to stash away a few important tomes, or hollow pillars in a shrine. Far more elaborate are the full-blown vaults containing a library store of powerful and important information on the grounds of large temples and monasteries. You can be sure that such things are always guarded by wards and guards despite the size. Large stashes may also be guarded by creatures like watch ghosts and watch spiders. Specific Places of Worship The Soaring Spirit once was a Dinirath temple held in the Snowflake Mountains. It was constructed and served as the resident temple of High Scrivener Catterley Bonaduce. After being attacked and destroyed by the former Ghost King and their minions, it now lies in ruin. As I mentioned earlier, Catterley, who is now the current Ghost King, wanders the grounds of the Soaring Spirit, constantly recasting wards. These wards serve to keep any creatures coming through a rift to the Shadowfell found within the ruined temple confined to just the grounds. As of recording in 4th edition, at least 100 plus years past the destruction of spirit soaring, the grounds are indeed haunted. Gargoyles seem to move about from night to night, a dirge can be heard coming from within the ruins, the statues that line the central chapel are blackened and covered in grime. Whether these are manifestations of the Ghost King's demeanor or the result of having a rift to the Shadowfell on the grounds themselves goes unsaid. Perhaps both are the cause of the Soaring Spirit's current state. Before the Soaring Spirit, 
another Denirath temple stood in its place, the Edificant Library. Here both clergies of Ogma and Denir carried out their work. This temple was destroyed in 1362 Dale Reckoning. The inner chamber is a temple to Denir in Burdusk. The temple serves two purposes. The first purpose is as a place of worship. The second is that the grounds of this temple contain the hidden harper hideout known as Twilight Hall. It is a complex of a few low fieldstone buildings, flying blue banners displaying a scattering of stars. The inner chamber has a unique collection of symbols seen not just on Faerun, but on different worlds and planes placed in folios. Officially, the complex is thought to be a property of the Denirath. However, the Harpers are the ones who operate within the majority of the complex. The Dancing Place is a place of pilgrimage, not just for Denirath, but for a host of deities who appeared when the Harpers were founded for a second time in this glade in Highdale. Alongside other clergy, Denirath maintained the glade while providing services to all good aligned adventurers. The Gallery Majesta is the first of two Denirath temples found in Callanport. This temple in the Quill Ward doubles as a museum. Specifically, the second floor of the temple displays replicas of powerful magic items. The true magic items are kept in a secret vault located beneath the temple. The vault can be accessed through the secret entrance beneath the temple's altar. The second temple in Callanport is a complex made of three temples devoted to Ogma, Malil, and Anir. This complex is known as the Scholar's Priory and is found in the Hook Ward. All three temples share a central courtyard. All three pitch in when it comes time to fill the central cistern shared by all. Several create water spells are cast to fill the cistern in the morning. Long ago in Myth Stranor's past, a shared temple could be found in the Shashirinum near neighborhood, or as it was known in the common tongue, the Temple Ward. This temple was called the Scholar's Hope. Here the clergies of Denir, Ogma, Dogmarin Brightmantle, and Coralon shared the temple grounds. Each deity had a shrine here. Denir's was an open-air shrine found on the uppermost level. All the clergies here came together, taught, and shared their respective knowledge. The Master's Library is a grand holy site in the Denirath faith. This hidden temple is located somewhere on the slopes of the Iron Dragon Mountain, found among the Earthfast mountain range. The stores of this library are even greater than that of Candlekeep, allegedly. The library's many archives are found in cavern complexes within the Iron Dragon Mountain itself. Sixty or so high librarians reside here in devoted service to Denir. They are led by the librarian supreme known as Halidurth Osprier. If he is still alive, this human is somewhere in the realm of 700 plus years old, his long life resulting from the grace of Denir. Should he ever require it, the Librarian Supreme can call for aid from eight mist dragons of varying ages who lair close by in the earth fast mountains. One of these dragons is the great worm Uranalathra, whom the year 231 Dale Reckoning, the year of the mist dragon, is named after. The Master's Library is a pilgrimage site almost every Denirath attempts to reach at least once in their lifetime. The only clearly visible structure of the library is the reading room, which is located far away from the actual temple library itself. Here someone can request some written work. The attendant at the reading room can then pass a note with the request through a small portal to reach where the true archives are located in the mountain. The requested Toma scroll then comes out of the same portal to be received. The reading room is guarded by several watch ghosts. Candlekeep is held to be a place of worship to the Nirath and other knowledge-based deities. People looking to get into Candlekeep are greeted by five Denirath clergy members who are also members of the Avowed of Candlekeep. They are the first line of individuals to determine if someone is allowed entry into the Grand Library's complex. 
Traditionally, entry is gained into Candlekeep by donating a copy of written work Candlekeep itself does not yet hold. The clergy of Denier are one of a select group of people who do not have to make such a donation and are admitted for free. However, they often will bring a donation anyways. A shrine to Denier can be found in Candlekeep. It is found in a demi-planar chamber attached to the hearth, Candlekeep's own tavern. The Vault of the Sages in Silvery Moon isn't necessarily a Denirath temple. However, the vault is operated by and guarded by a large contingent of Denirath clergy. This horseshoe-shaped, five stories tall building has another five floors below ground. Candlekeep may have the grandest collection of the written word on the continent, but the vault's claim to fame is a greater number of specialized, intelligent, and experienced sages who are on staff. The temples of Ogma and Denir in Waterdeep share a secret library held in the bowels of some unsaid mountain. While this sounds an awful lot like the Master's Library, I think this one is its own separate sanctuary of knowledge. The Denirath take full supervision for the maintenance and defense of the secret library. Both temples in Waterdeep have elaborate key portals that require different methods to activate these respective portals. The portals on the secret library side are key to transport creatures only, so as to stop any books from leaving its stores. Named temples to Denier include the Silent Room in Suzale, the Hallowed House of Higher Achievement in Selgaunt, and the House of the Tablets in Yaon. Unnamed shrines to Denier can be found in the Scrivener's Scribes and Clerk's Guild House in Waterdeep, Arabelle, Dareloon, Ordolin, from Lasper and Pro Camper. Character Options For 2nd edition, the Glyph Scribe Specialty Priest can be found in Face and Avatars. An option for Denirath Crusaders and the Wordsmith Priest variant can be found in Warriors and Priests of the Realms. The following is a breakdown of the features that I think someone deeply involved in Denirath's faith, as an acolyte or otherwise, would have for their background in 5th edition. For your two skill proficiencies, religion, and one of either nature, arcana, or history. For your language or tool proficiencies, proficiency with calligrapher supplies, and one language of your choice. For your background equipment, there's the Sages for the Player's Handbook, the Cloistered Scholars from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, and the Anthropologists from Tomb of Annihilation. Though, with the gold pieces attached to each of these three backgrounds, I would just subtract it to start off the game with a holy symbol of Denier. For the ribbon feature of the background, there is a few that might be of interest. There's the anthropologist adept linguist. There's the archaeologist historical knowledge in Tomb of Annihilation. The acolytes shelter the faithful from the player's handbook. The sages researcher. And the cloistered scholars library access. Next is a list of subclasses that I think would be thematically appropriate for a NPC or PC to take if they are a worshipper of Denier. For the Bard, there's the College of Lore Bard from the Player's Handbook. For the Cleric, there's the Knowledge Domain from the Player's Handbook, and Arcana Domain from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. For the Fighter, there's the Eldritch Knight from the Player's Handbook, and Rune Knight from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. For the Monk, there's the Way of the Open Hand, from the Player's Handbook. For the Rogue, there's the Inquisitive Rogue from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Sorcerer, there's the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. The Warlock, the Celestial Warlock from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And finally, for Wizards, the Abjuration Wizard from the Player's Handbook and Scribe's Wizard from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Dungeon Master Options to start, we're just going to list off some 5th edition official monster stat blocks that the Faith of Denier could make use of. From the Monster Manual, there's the Deva, Andro Sphinx, and Gyno Sphinx. Finally, from Candlekeep Mysteries, the Swarm of Animated Books. Now I'll just touch on some 5th edition monsters that Denier's Faith makes use of that as of yet do not have 5th edition official stat blocks. Watch Ghosts which are sometimes called unsleeping guardians, are incorporeal, intelligent, undead creatures. 
Their limbs look to be covered in pale white flesh, but their torsos and lower bodies instead have a skeletal appearance. Their eyes are always empty black pits. Due to the method of their creation, they are immune to turn on dead. They can lash out with a cold beam attack and a chilling melee touch attack. Another unique ability to them is the ability to make a bright aura appear around their opponent's magic items. The intention behind this ability is to attract any surrounding monsters and or creatures toward the opponent. Watch ghosts are created to serve as guardians to watch over tombs, keeps, and the like. Usually they are created by evil clerics, evil wizards, or undead lords and ladies through an 8th level spell called Create Watch Ghost. A successful casting of the spell over a corpse will manifest a watch ghost with the intelligence of the being who was once alive. The watch ghost, while intelligent, is bound to fulfill the commands of the caster who created them. I think it is fair to say that any watch ghosts utilized by the faith of the near are those who voluntarily accept such a duty. The statistics and breakdown for watch ghosts can be found in the second edition box set the ruins of Undermountain. Anhariar are celestial warriors who fell in battle as humanoids. Of course, these celestial warriors might be known to you better through Norse myth, and indeed they have a large presence on the outer plane of Ysgar. They can be found in 3rd edition's Deities and Demigods, 2nd edition's Monstrous Compendium Outer Plains Appendix, and Planescape Monstrous Compendium Appendix, and 1st edition's Manual of the Plains. Light Asimons are celestial amorphous creatures seemingly made of multi-hued radiant light. When looking upon a light Asimon, a good aligned person is said to be able to see a reflection of their finest moment in their life. They can serve as familiars for high-leveled good aligned spellcasters. There is a unique ritual that may be attempted to call upon the aid of a light Asimon. They are thought to be the very embodiment of good in a physical form. The second edition stat block can be found in Monstrous Compendium of Planescape and Monstrous Compendium Outer Plains Appendix. Incarnates are beings formed from the pure energy of a given concept like courage, hope, or wisdom. Wisdom incarnates are specifically said to be creatures tied to the Denirath faith, but there are several other types of incarnates including evil ones. Incarnates can be found throughout all the Outer Plains, but of course the good aligned ones are prevalent in the Upper Plains. Wisdom Incarnates are a lesser type of incarnate. These creatures bond with other creatures who are strong in the trait they embody, and can confer benefits to the host. While the incarnate feeds off the emotion put out by the individual, technically a bonded incarnate can control the host against their will, However, that is a tactic almost only utilized entirely by the evil incarnates. Their second edition stat block can be found in Planescape Monstrous Compendium Appendix. Watch spiders are bred to serve as guardians of a given location. They do not spin web to trap opponents, but are large, fast, stealthy, and have a poisonous bite. Their poison paralyzes their target. They are quite intelligent for a beast and can be taught to differentiate between intruders and normal visitors. They do spin webs elsewhere, but these webs are meant just as a resting place. Watch spiders can be found in the 2nd edition box set City of Splendors and 3rd edition's Waterdeep City of Splendors. Baku Holy Ones are a rare subset of the creature known as a Baku. This elephantine creature has some strange physical characteristics to go along with its normal elephant-like features. Lion-like hind legs, dragon-like body, back, and tail. They may move about invisibly as they can do so at will, rarely being seen by people in the subtropical areas they tend to live. They are quite intelligent, wielding different psionic abilities, and wielding all sorts of simple items held in their trunks like swords or wands. Of course, given their stature, they also attack with their strong legs and tusks. They are native to the outlands and the outer plains. A vast majority of them tend to be neutral good in alignment. However, there are evil and neutrally aligned Baku. The true neutral Baku, also known as the Great Ones or the Holy Ones, only make up 5% of all Baku. These creatures can be found in 1st edition's Monster Manual 2, 2nd edition The Complete Psionics Handbook, 
in Planescape Appendix Monstrous Compendium. Movonic Devas are one of three subset of Devas described in earlier editions of Dungeons and Dragons. Devas as we know them usually are active messengers of the good deities on material planes. Some sources will describe them as strictly male. Their skin is white like snow with silver eyes and hair, though they may be lawful, neutral, or chaotic good in alignment. Movonic Devas are most active on the prime material plane. Most tend to carry magical slender great swords with an enchantment on them that functions much like a flame tongue weapon. Unsurprisingly, they wield all sorts of helpful and protective divine magics. They are able to pass into the material plane at will, and when they arrive, they usually shape change into the form of an animal or humanoid to go by undetected. Movonic Devas can be found in 1st edition's Monster Manual 2. 2nd edition Planescape Appendix Monstrous Compendium, and 3rd edition's Fiend Folio. To round out the section on creatures, the following are just a list of humanoid NPC stat blocks to represent various the Nirath worshippers of clergy. Keep in mind with the spellcasters, you can always swap out their listed spells for those that are more fitting. For the Monster Manual, the Acolyte, Mage, Archmage, and Priest. From Candlekeep Mysteries, the Master Sage, and Sage. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, Abjurer, and the Martial Arts of Depth. From Strixhaven, Curriculum of Chaos, the Lorehold Professor of Order. Alright, on to the last topic in the Dungeon Master Options section of the podcast. Magic Items. The Tome of Universal Harmony is the holiest tome in the Denirath Faith. As such, only the one who is the nearest chosen has the ability to read it. Within our mysterious runes, even the chosen is only able to identify and read one or two of these runes per page. The runes form a song, and despite even the chosen's limited capability in deciphering them, the chosen learns to attune themselves to the song and receive a further array of spells to tap into. The tome is passed on from the current chosen, to the individual deemed to be the next chosen. Since this item is described in a second edition source, the mechanics attached to it use that edition's terms. To start, someone can try to read the Tome of Universal Harmony for the first time. If they fail the initial system shock roll, they fall asleep. A success grants them the ability to press forward and study the Tome. Through further intelligence and system shock rolls, a person can begin to understand it. Should they succeed in 50 system shock rolls, they gain the mantle of Chosen of Denier. Though there is significant risk attached, as failure on any of these system shock rolls will cause a person to die. Catterly Bonadus was bequeathed and successfully studied the Tome of Universal Harmony after it was passed on from the former Chosen of Denier and Catterly's personal mentor, Pertelope, both of whom we discussed earlier. I do not know where this tome is currently held. Catterly no longer has possession of it, but Sword Coast Adventurer's Guy calls out that it is still held in veneration as the holiest the Nirath tome. The Mighty Rune of the Master is an important spell tome in the Denirath faith. It was created in 1332 Dale Reckoning by a powerful Halruan Archmage. Denir appeared to this Archmage in a dream and passed along the instructions to create it. Like most tomes described in 2nd edition's Prayers from the Faithful, this one too has an odd appearance. The tome looks like a three-dimensional glyph constructed of some metallic alloy treated with an ever-bright enchantment. The rune remains stationary while held, but releasing it into the air causes it to immediately raise somewhat up to eye level and hover. It chimes softly as it hangs in the air. Any spell that involves the creation of or shaping of a glyph or rune attempted within 40 feet of the rune is immediately nullified. However, if one holds on to the mighty rune and casts one of these spells, the spell is empowered or doubled. The roster of spells found within the mighty rune can be learned by touching the rune and speaking Denier's name. A ghostly voice will then speak aloud the spells within in alphabetical order. The details of a spell can be viewed by touching the rune and speaking aloud one of the spells mentioned by the ghostly voice. 
The tome projects the details in midair in a glowing script. If someone suspects a glyph or symbol is present on a given surface, touching the rune to the surface will cause them to glow and not activate. Should the holder of the mighty rune wish, they can nullify the glyph or symbol by touching the rune to it. The Nirath who wield it can choose from three unique spellcasting books they can make use of daily. Denir has instructed his clergy that the mighty rune is to be left out in the wider world and not for them to keep in one of their archives or libraries. The last known location of the mighty rune of the master was in the hands of doppelgangers in Swarnubal. The following are some thematically appropriate magic items from official 5th edition sources I feel the faith of Denir may have access to. From the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Candle of Invocation, specifically one that is neutral good in alignment. Gem of Seeing, Headband of Intellect, Helm of Comprehending Languages, The Ioun Stone of Insight, Intellect, or Mastery, Robe of Eyes, Tome of Clear Thought, Tome of Understanding, Wand of Magic Detection, and Wand of Secrets. From Exandria Guide to Wild Mount, The Dispelling Stone and Goggles of Object Reading. From Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, a plus one to plus three all purpose tool. From Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Potion of Comprehension in the Professor Orb. From Waterdeep Dragon Heist, the Ring of Truth Telling. From Strixhaven, Curriculum of Chaos, the Lower Hold Primer. From Tales from the Yawning Portal, Mirror of the Past. Finally, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Candle of the Deep. Instrument of Scribing, Orb of Direction, and Orb of Time. Thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. Audio versions of the podcast can be found on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play Podcasts. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter is at Shizembrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. Continuing on with the deities of knowledge and invention, I will be covering Malil, the neutral good god of poetry and song, in the next episode. Until next time, may Timora look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode, Sami by Ian Grimm of tubersongs.com.